My name is Rebecca Lloyd and um, I'm from the UL Hospital Group. So just want to, it's not moving on. Oh, there we are. Just give you a little bit of background. Uh, the University Hospital Limerick is a model for acute hospital, uh, serving over half a million people living in Limerick City County, County Tipperary and County Clare. We have 28 inpatient wards with over 3,600 staff. 220,000 people passed through our emergency department in 2022 and 896 people died in our hospital in 2022. Work is underway for an additional 96 bedded unit in 2024 and an additional 96 beds in 2026. Um, and I, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Limerick Hospital, so I, I just really wanted to let you know what, what we are dealing with here. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about me. So I'm not a nurse. Um, I seem to apologise quite a lot for being not a nurse, but I am an end-of-life care coordinator, and I started in March 2022. Never worked in the acute sector, but I really wanted to add value quickly. I wanted, as we all do when we... Uh, move jobs. I wanted to hit the ground running. And the care after death process started with the end of life committee meeting, discussing the challenges following the COVID-19 pandemic. And what they said was, we really need to relook at care after death. Because those of us, those of you that worked through the pandemic, there were lots of different processes brought in if somebody died from COVID. So that people were put in double body bags. Uh, there was lots of obviously infection control and there was quite a lot of confusion about where do we go now? Do we go back to where we were before COVID or do we need new, um, new instructions? So everybody was very much confused. So it was like, well, let's have a look what we have. And, and this is what's existed actually. I took a photograph of everything that we had. So we had these big purple folders we have one here and filled with so many leaflets, so much information, and they were on every single ward. So there was an old checklist, but it wasn't in task order. There was a deaf entry form, and I wandered around the whole hospital. I must have spoken to 100 people, and nobody knew why it was filled in. What was really interesting about it, it was on really, really high quality paper. It was professionally printed, and everybody thought that this was the uh, the death certificate. So what was really, really interesting was that form was being filled in, but the death notification form wasn't being filled in and nothing else was being filled in, just this very fancy form that we had absolutely no idea why it existed. There was a cremation form, rarely completed, uh, which led to frustrated families and funeral directors. Patients were arriving at the morgue in many different clothes, dressed, undressed, washed, unwashed, lines in, lines out, some in body bags, some not in body bags. And the result of that was we had confused staff not knowing what to do after all the rules of COVID-19. And then in the cupel system management we were receiving, you know, this, this patient wasn't treated properly, this wasn't the way that we should do things, but there really wasn't like a clear cut answer. And the death notification forms were rarely filled in on time. So there were quite a few challenges that we were, we were kind of looking at. But the underlying philosophy of, of all of us that work in end-of-life care is that this is essential. Uh, it's an essential aspect of hospital care that requires the utmost respect and sensitivity and dignity for our, for our patients and their families. So, you know, we were driven by this philosophy. And then there's this principle of simplicity by Albert Einstein. So, you know, if you look at what he said, he said, just do with what you have. And if you don't have too much, get rid of what you don't need. Make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. So I think that was kind of in, in the forefront of our mind. I think when you do things in plain English, like we're really conscious of we need to make things simple, but not simpler. We're not dumbing down. We're just making it simple and easy to understand. And I just want to show you this little video, if it works. No, our Wi-Fi is rubbish. So basically what the video is meant to show you is a pit stop really quickly. So what's interesting, it really is there were some doctors in Wales, paediatric surgeons, and when they were doing surgery, 
they were finding that things were going wrong and things weren't in order and things weren't the way that they should be. And they went home one evening after a particularly hard day and they sat and they watched, uh, one of them sat and watched the Grand Prix. And he saw how these pit stops work really quickly. Everybody knows what they've got to do. Everyone has a task. Everyone knows where they are and how they're meant to do it. And they asked the pit stop people to come to their hospital and have a look at, at their process and what they were doing. And again, by having someone else have a look at a process. And I think this is where, because I was so new, I was kind of looking at this process with curiosity. And why do we do that? And when would we do that? So the, a lot of it was, was kind of me questioning the process and how does that work and who has a role there? So kind of moved on from there. And then there's also, I'm a big fan of um, this man, Atul Gawande. Um, I don't know if ever you've read his book, Being Mortal. It really is a must. But he's written this checklist manifesto. And he said this, one essential characteristic of modern life is that we all depend on systems, on assemblages of people or technologies or both. And among our pro most profound difficulties is making them work. So we all know what we have to do. It's just how do we do it and in what order do we do it? So they were kind of just some things that were ticking in the back of my mind about how what, what can we do to make this a little bit easier. So what was the objectives of the project? They were to standardize the process and procedure for caring for a patient in the dying phase and after death. It was to improve communication with the family of those who are dying or who have died. And it was to ensure some domains of care were covered, the physical, the spiritual, and make sure that all staff are trained and competent in care after death. So, how did we do it? So we started by just reviewing all the paperwork, like you showed in that photograph earlier on, um, look at the standard operating procedures for care after death, and all quite old. Um, then I started with an audit. So what do we know um, about the current process? What works and what doesn't work? What's needed on the wards to enable them to provide competent and compassionate care? What do they need? And then there's this place is full of really competent, compassionate people, our mortuary staff, what do they need? And they said, we need people dressed properly, we need people washed, we need people to understand the post-mortem process. Um, this is what we need. The senior nurses, clinical skills facilitators, they were just such a wealth of knowledge saying, this is what we did when we were training. But the senior nurses, what was really interesting was actually care after death has changed since they had trained. And, and their skills needed updating as well. But we had a bit of a short literature review and a benchmark. So what are people doing in other countries? Um, what are people doing in other hospitals? What are people doing elsewhere? And, and how, how are we against them? And patient advocacy service, services, do we get complaints about care after death? Um, is, there, is there anything that they're hearing? What are they hearing on? Because they're on, on wards as well. What do they know? So was, we asked all of those people. And then analysed all that. So I had a look at the gaps in the current process. Um, where are the areas for improvements? And are there any unnecessary steps? And there really were. It was so interesting. We looked at all the data from the staff. What do they need? Training and educational needs. And they were just crying out for training. They just wanted to know what to do. Um, especially in the wards where the, the death rate is high. So the ICU, the HDU the emergency department um, and we needed to identify opportunities to improve communication with family members you know we have a lot of deaths in our hospital but for a family member it's it's a, a life a life an awful life occurrence for them it's not it's not something that happens to them every day so we needed to be really cognizant of that and what were the results it, so we started we had this standardized protocol for caring for a patient after death there was one booklet per person. Um, it started out, this is the first one that we started. It had a hard, but actually a hard back infection control. It had the death notification. I don't know if you can see that on the first page. And then it had all the pages in it. Um, so there's one booklet per patient. And for the avoidance of, di di <laughs> avoidance of doubt, there were clearly demarked pages per discipline. So the nurses' pages were had a have a, a line in purple. Um, the administration doesn't have any colours on, the consultant team is in green. It's written in plain English with simple, clear steps. 
And these clear step guidelines had places to tick and for you to sign um, serrated edges for removable pages. So uh, there's a, a page that goes down to the, the mortuary with the patient. There's um, the cremation paperwork that goes to the funeral director, that's serrated pages. You can just see there that there's a flow chart to try and help the medical team or the consulting team to see, does this person need to be referred to the coroner? Do I need to make a cut? So we tried to kind of answer all the questions. But then we also put in, actually, this is an opportunity, even in the dying phase, does it, can we give the bereaved people or the people who are sitting by the bed, give them a cup of tea? Have we put the symbol out? Have we got all the bereavement care? Do we have all the information that people need when they need it? So it's kind of predicting, preempting um, the staff to kind of just get their ducks in a row during the dying phase and after somebody dies. And then the pilot was between September 22 and December 22. So we did it in eight wards over four months. Um, the wards were where the most deaths are, like the ICU, the HGU, the emergency department, and they're called the eights. So the um, the eight B, C, and D. So they are wards where extremely sick people are. They're a step down from the ICU, really. Um, and we trained staff in small cohorts with the clinical skills facilitators. We went through page by page. We explained how this is going to work. And then we measured the effectiveness by the patient's arrival at the mortuary. Is the booklet being filled in? Because the booklet is kept with the notes. So we could pull the charts to see that the booklet's been filled in. Has it been ticked? Has it been signed? Is all the paperwork together? Um, so it was a really, really lovely um, pilot. And then we evaluated it. So we put surveys up on all of the wards. And the results from that was the staff commented that they preferred the booklet, especially the tear out sheets. They had all the information for each patient in just one place. And it was really interesting that it clearly said what is a nurse's role and what is not a nurse's role and what is a consultant's role and what is not a consultant's role and what is an administration role and what is not. So very clearly, again, going back to the pit stop, everybody has a role to play and this is your job and not somebody else's. Staff found it easy to use and unambiguous. Patients were prepared and dressed as per the guidelines. Like we left very little room for doubt. So there wasn't put somebody's pajamas on or a clean gown. It was put them in a clean disposable gown. Everybody goes in a body bag. And there were reasons for that. And I have conversations with my co colleagues regularly about the use of body bags. Um, but we just decided we'll just try this one way and get this to work. We, everyone started using the end of life resources much, much more. We were family started to receive the resources that were in the lockers. Funeral directors were delighted with the cremation paperwork turnaround. <laughs> Death notification forms, there was some improvement, not as much as I would like, but there was some improvement. What we didn't expect. So we didn't expect it to be so popular. Um, and what happened was, the, the booklets were taken by other nurses and brought into the other wards, um, which was a bit annoying because we were trying to keep it within these wards, but it was so popular and everybody liked it that it, it the, the booklets just kind of went missing onto other wards and we knew that was happening. Um, and the other wards were very upset they weren't on the pilot. Another really wonderful consequence was deaths in single rooms went up and continue to rise. So from October to October, year on year, we've gone from 69% of people dying in single rooms to 94%. And actually last month it was 96% because there's a prompt in the care of after death booklet saying, is your patient in a single room? So it's really get, get that in the forefront of people's minds. And it really is now part of the culture of the hospital that people die in a single room. And my wish is that we get to 100%. Well, some people thought it was too simple. Uh, we, Like I said earlier, we, we dumbed down the process and it was too simple. And who am I, not a nurse, telling nurses um, their job. And it also shone a light on other problems. So it's really interesting. Once we'd solved these problems, it kind of just moved on and we were all these other things. So especially referral to coroner um, and filling in death notification forms, it, it still remains a problem. Um, but today, where are we today? 
care of the deaf is on every ward. It's used by all staff and is recognised now as a standardised protocol within the hospital. It's a live document. Um, and when I say live, I only print it in 500s, so we can change it every six months. Um, and that means that if somebody comes and says, do you know what, we should put this in or we should try this, then we try it and we have a look at it. Um, it's very much an open forum that people know me and can come and say, you've repeated this, there's a spell mistake here. Um, so th it's this lovely, constantly monitored and evaluated um, philosophy, ethos we have, I suppose, now. We haven't had one complaint since October on the way a patient is cared for after death, i.e. in the way that the body is cared for. There's not been one cupos. Um, there hasn't been anything down in the mortuary of anybody uh, not prepared the way that they should be. And staff feel that they can give competent and compassionate care. And it's not that they weren't given it before, but they have this surety that they have a little checklist and they have everything that they need. They know what to do and when to do it. But look, it's not all a bed of roses. These things rarely are. So, you know, we still have problems with death notification forms, completion and referral to coroners. Even when I've added more lists to the form, so the second iteration of the care after death is in softer paper. And it has holes to go into their patient's charts. And on the back page has the full list of, of when to refer to a coroner, as well as the front page with the, um, the flow chart that we had earlier. So we, we keep on trying. It's sister document, um, the bereavement booklet, which was developed at the same time, um, isn't used as much. So we know that because I know it's not used as much because I have more of these than I have of the death notification forms. Um, so I just have this feeling that the, the tasks have been done, but like Roisin said about the heart part, I need the heart part to be done because there's a lot of the head part was being done, the ticks of the boxes, but I need, I need the heart part now. So it's my job now just to raise awareness on the bereavement booklet and make sure that our uh, bereaved are receiving the now and the next, the information that they need. So the future, um, there's a, there's a, I look after a lot of hospitals, so I look after another, um, three Model 2 hospitals, a maternity hospital and a paediatric hospital. Um, the Model 2 hospitals, it's been piloted, the care after death now has been changed and it's been piloted in the Model 2 hospitals in Ennis Nina and St John's in September 2023. The paediatric hospital at the moment is reviewing it and we hope to start that pilot as well. Slightly different because of the mortuary guidelines. So, um, And the maternity hospital is also looking at at it so it's very much um an appetite to be used in one way or another throughout the whole group um and then because we've got people using this as a, a, a standard protocol in the hospital we all know about the mortuary guidelines coming down the road we'll be able to implement form one and form three so form one is the referral to the coroner so that will go into the doctor section and form three is talking to um, people if someone talking to family members or emergency contacts following a death should their person need a post-mortem. So we'll be able to implement those and then go back to the training because it, all of that now exists. So um, that's me. Thank you. I hope I didn't go on too long, Lucy. Thank you so much for listening. There's all my details there if anyone wants to contact me. Thank you. Well, Bex, you didn't go on it at all. I think I could listen to this project all day. Um, fantastic presentation. And thank you so much to speaking to this award. Um, and I know whenever I mention it to anyone in passing, when I mention the QI awards, there's a real interest around it and around how you've implemented this process. So it's, it's fantastic to get further insight. I can see Neve's hands already up. So I'm assuming Neve's got a question. But at this stage, if you want to raise your hand, I'll go to me first. Um, but please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask, be it on the QI awards, on Bex's presentation, or using a quality improvement approach. Um, alternatively, if you'd prefer to pop your question into the chat, I'm happy to read that out loud as well. So, Neve, did you want to come in with your question? I did. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks a million, uh, Bex. A brilliant, you know, I love that booklet totally. But I'm just wondering with regards to 